On this week's Ticket Stubs, we're talking about a blockbusting mind bender of a film from Christopher Nolan. As to which one, why my sweet boy, I'll give you a hint. When it came out, there were people everywhere thinking they were so smart for understanding it. And if you didn't follow it, you were dumb. Then he followed it up with Tenet, making those very people themselves look like dum-dums. That's right, we're talking about Inception from 2010. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Ryan, would you Fantastic. like to go? <laughs> I would love to go. <clears throat> so, you know how Christopher Nolan recently released his movie Tenet, which was about time manipulation? Well, today's movie plays with the exact same concept of time, except for this one actually makes some sense. Plus, you can hear what the fuck is going on. Today, we're talking about Inception. <laughs> I love yours so much, Ryan. <laughs> Quality. Oh. My one's throwing a spanner in the works. This is a bit of a wild card, I think. Because <laughs> mine, just like Tenet, makes no sense. <laughs> okay. The perfect movie. Could we be dreaming? Wake up and smell the Nolan. Christopher Nolan, Hans Zimmer, and the entire Batman cast is back, except for Liam Neeson. This week we watched Inception. Let's jump right into it. <laughs> I love the smell of Nolan oh. in the morning. <laughs> Who doesn't? We've had a, ourselves a very special three-way intro. Our first three-way, boys. Our first Whoa. one. Oh my god. Mm. <laughs> How are you both? Very well, thank you. How are you, boys? Mate, I'm doing good on this beautiful Monday night. Yeah, we're recording on a the start of the week for a change. Um well, I've, uh, I've actually got a big week ahead, my buddies. Um, well, as of this recording, I've just celebrated my one-year anniversary. Ooh. And I, oh, my goodness. And it's my birthday by the time this comes out. So, uh, oh, yeah, I'll Lord. be the ripe old age of, of 32. I can start taking my fish oil tablets and my iron tablets and all sorts of things. Lord help us, it's Dane's birth week. Yeah. <laughs> Stay out of his way. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I'm good. I'm good. It's a it's a oh, busy old week. That's good. That's good to hear. That's great to hear. So man. another week has come. Another movie has been watched. And uh, had you guys seen Inception before? Yes, I actually. This was my um, very first Christopher Nolan experience. Not from this watching alone. But when Inception came out, that was the first Nolan movie I'd ever seen. I hadn't seen The Batmans. Uh, I hadn't seen anything he'd done beforehand, making me look like a real silly Billy. Ryan, um, Ryan is judging <laughs> you so hard right now. Yeah, wow. I can feel, um, I can feel the radiation, and, and I, I, I apologize for using rough language like "silly Billy" so early on. Um, <laughs> We're going to need that explic banner across this <laughs> I'll, episode. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sure to beep out my baldy talk. Um, you need to put a course, like a parental yeah. guidance warning at the beginning of this one. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Ryan, what about um, you, buddy? Uh, yeah, well, I've always been a very big Chris Nolan fan. Um, I've seen all of his movies, um, including Tenet, which... I don't want to talk about ever. Um, but yeah, I loved Inception when I first saw it. I saw it at the movies. Um, and like, I still remember the first time I saw that trailer. I don't know if you guys remember it, but that first trailer was so good. It had like all the best shots from the movie in it. Nothing made sense. And then they had the that Hans Zimmer score with the, the big bois noise and it was just so good it was just amazing yeah and the movie yeah it was it was a damn good movie i did not think i really understood it until probably the second or third time mm -hmm. but yeah it was great it's, it's so a good. lot to take in this movie it's a lot mm. to take yeah. in the first time you watch it there's a lot happening like writing my notes for this because to, to spell it all out for people mm. was laborious <laughs> it was horrible <laughs> yeah Huge. Well, like like I said in my intro, when uh, Inception came out, 
people were like confused and like, oh, what a dumb dog you are. We're so smart. And then no one understood what the fuck was happening in Tenet. And it really just made Inception seem like child's play. <laughs> Like, how do I ever find Inception yeah. difficult to understand? I've just spent yeah. three hours not hearing a word of this movie. Well, it, it took Christopher Nolan, like, ten years to write this script or something like that. Yeah, he came up with yeah. it when he was 16, apparently. Yeah, uh, which is pretty pretty yeah. incredible to actually... Mm. Like, we've all, you know, made little movies and stuff together and mm. with other people and to make a movie that you thought of when you were 16 and have everybody see it that's pretty that's pretty like bucket list shit there it's pretty yeah. good yeah <laughs> but like i can't even imagine the planning that goes into this movie because it's just there's so many things going yeah. on all the time i feel so like, bad <laughs> yeah even just trying to wrap your head around it like it's just crazy I haven't read the script, but I think the script would be really interesting to actually oh, read. Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's like you know when you re- when you watch the Lord of the Rings movies and you try to imagine like them describing like Legolas surfing down a whole bunch of orcs on a shield. Like, <laughs> I always think about that. I'm like, how do they write that into a script? <laughs> yeah. I um, I'm actually, I don't know if if you guys are, are ready for this. I'm about to rustle some jimmies. Um. I don't know if Inception is really that great. I don't know if it holds up as much as uh, as what it did. Dane, I have to kind of agree with you. I think this is probably the sixth time I watched it. And yeah, I was like, yeah, this is a little bit of a slog. I don't know if it was just because I'd seen it so many times. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. It's like so well made, but um, yeah. I, I think know. one thing... Oh, it's... <laughs> no- Nolan makes an incredible movie. There's no doubt about it. Um, and obviously his ideas for each thing are sort of like really grandiose and bizarre and unique and whatnot. But, yeah, I don't know. I think I just prefer him um, as a director with just kind of... Like, the Batman trilogies were fantastic and and everything else. Mm. But I'm like, he kind of gets... I don't want to use the word pretentious or maybe, like, his ideas get a bit too big for their boots. Like Again, mm. Tenet. No one knows what was fucking going on in Tenet. Um, yeah. I don't know. I just, I just would prefer if he just stuck with kind of other material that doesn't make me so head-scratchy at the same time. Yeah. I, yeah, I don't know. Well, I... I do agree with you. Like, I'm very excited. Like, as I said, I'm a big fan of his, but, like, I can't wait to see his next movie, which is, like, about Oppenheimer, who made the atomic bomb. Ooh. Mm. And, like, it's got a killer cast already, as you'd expect. But, like, hopefully it's a bit more of a smaller story and it's not trying to be the biggest worldly movie you've ever seen. Yeah. Mm. There's a lot going on. And I hope it's just, like, a smaller character thing that has, like, real-world stakes and, obviously, real-world consequences, but... Yeah, I think that could be really interesting if he kind of toned it yeah. down a little bit for this next one, but who knows? We'll have to wait and see. I think probably the biggest <laughs> the biggest thing that I realised while watching is, like, like you, Ryan, it was probably, like, I've always been a big Nolan fan. This was probably the seventh time I've watched it, sixth or seventh, just like you. Um, and one of the characters, Elliot Page, is in this movie, and their character is... It just, they just ask questions constantly. Like, have you noticed that? Mm. Like, that character is literally just yeah, there yeah. to ask questions more so than it. She's yeah. just. That it, character he, is sorry. the audience. Yeah, I was like, about to say the exact same thing. Because they're like, oh, what's happening now? And Joseph Gordon Levitt's like, okay, guys, <laughs> grab out a notebook. Yeah. And you, <laughs> exactly so what's happening. We're doing this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, that's, it's, it's kind of. Those are the type of glaringly, like, when you first watch it, if, it's one of those movies where if you don't think too hard about it and you just enjoy it at face value, you're like, bloody hell, what a good film that was. Um, mm. But yeah, well, in saying that, shall we jump into it? Let's do it. I'm, I'm ready. Let's do it. So, Inception, heist movie and science fiction movie all in one. It's a classic corporate espionage, heist, heisty boy, 
and it's also got a lot of science that doesn't make any sense, but we're going to go along <laughs> with it anyway. <laughs> so we open with Hans Zimmer's thunderous score, the classic wah that we all know and love. Um, fun- oh, you broke out the thesaurus for this one, didn't you? Hey, I'm a well-spoken <laughs> lady. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when I'm the host. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of the time, I'm like, fuck this, fuck that. <laughs> 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 that was fucking shit. Um, fun fact, I actually saw a, um, Hans Zimmer perform this live when he was in Australia the last time before COVID hit. So that would have been incredible. It was incredible. Mm. I was brought to tears. It was amazing. Probably the yeah. best concert I've ever been. He's to. he's had a crazy career. He has. <laughs> I didn't even know like... he wrote the score for Madagascar. Like, <laughs> what the hell? I feel like this is like dead set. You know how there's like the six degrees of Ke- Kevin Bacon. Mm. Yes. yes. There's where I think most of the films we've done. There's like six degrees of Marty the Zebra. <laughs> I was just saying oh, that. Yeah. Is this a shared universe? Because yeah. I brought up Madagascar when we watched Spiral. Yeah. And then I'm pretty and I said, sure I just brought it up Marty again Zebra. Um, when we watched New Jack City. So it's all it's all coming <laughs> we together. <do>. Yeah. <laughs> Marty's at the I love all these crossovers. Yeah, the MCU, the Madagascar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cinematic universe. Yeah. But yeah, okay. So yeah, we open up with Hans Zimmer's thunderous wow that underscores the whole movie like this is you're going to hear a lot about the bois dominic cobb wakes up washed ashore on an unknown beach and he hears the laughter and chatter of children and sees two kids playing in the sand in the distance and he tries to reach out to them but he's too fucking tired so he goes back to back to being all wet and drowned on the beach and He's woken up by an armed guard prodding a rifle into his back and he doesn't wake up. So the guy goes, hey, you know what? I'm going to search his pockets. That's what you do when you find a guy on the beach. <laughs> so, and he's got a bloody pistol tucked into the back of his pants. And the man calls over the other guards in Japanese and they pick him up. And we cut to a grand dining room where an old man sits at the head of the table and they tell him, hey, this bloke was found on the beach and he was kind of delirious and stuff. But he said your name, and all he had was a gun and a metal spinning top. And old Ben's like, whoa, what the fuck? So they bring in Dom, now in handcuffs, and he slurps up a whole bunch of food, and the man questions him about what the heck he's doing there. And he says... Can I just say that the uh, the makeup of um, the old fellow... Ken, I Ken thought, Watanabe, yeah, Ken how looked, dare you? Yeah. I oh, know, sorry, Ken wants an RB. I thought his makeup looked very average. Yeah. I, I'll cop, I'll cop yeah. that. Yeah. I'll cop that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> but yeah, so he's at the other end of the table and he asks Leonardo DiCaprio, which I haven't even mentioned that, but Leonardo DiCaprio's in this movie. And he says, Are you here to kill me? And he reveals that he knows what the top is and he spins it on the table, saying it belonged to a man that he met in a half remembered dream. A man, he says, who possessed some radical notions. Then we cut to another scene. Oh my god. We're set in the same dining room. (laughs) A younger Japanese man, which it is revealed is Ken Watanabe, now sitting at the head of the table. And Dom doesn't look like he's just drowned now. He's looking very tidy and he's got a very nice haircut. (laughs) And he asks, what is the most resilient parasite? A bacteria a virus, an intestinal worm, it is in fact an idea. And this is where it is revealed that it's a very, it's a thick plot. Like, it's really, it's a lot to wrap your head around. So it's revealed that Dom and Mm. his companion Arthur, who's played by Joseph Gordon-Levitt, they're extractors and they perform corporate espionage using experimental military technology to infiltrate their target's subconscious and extract information through a shared dream world and they are in fact in the middle of a dream right now but Ken Watanabe doesn't know it yet what did you guys think of this opening scene did you think it was confusing did you like it what was the, what was the crack mm. 
Ryan, you go. Are you throwing that to me, Dana? Yeah. Yeah. I really liked the opening scene, and I don't want to sound too much like an idiot, but I didn't realize that old Ken um, is from the end of the movie. What did you think of it, Dane? Mm. You look very, you um, look very perturbed. You look, yeah. I was I'm, gonna say, you're like, I do not care. I, uh, <laughs> I'm gonna gonna break out in my thesaurus and say that I am, I'm I'm very flummoxed. No, I liked it. Like, obviously, with Nolan, his sets are always incredible, and uh, throughout this whole movie, everything's very stylish. It's uh, like a Dream themed James Bond. There's style coming out mm, your ears, yeah. um, and every dream kind of has like a different theme. So this one's set in Japan. Later on, it's set in Serbia or wherever. It's it's a globe trotting yeah. adventure. Yeah, because um, they set the yeah. dreams, and, which we'll get into when we go further into the film. But they set the dreams for the target that they're trying to extract information from, basically. Mm. I can tell already that this podcast is um, this episode. <laughs> it's going to be. Uh, it's going to be a, a long little, one. Yeah, and it's also going to be a, a little bit all over <laughs> the shop yeah. because this movie is. Yeah, it's yeah. a lot. Um, can I just bring up one more yeah. point? Chris Nolan worked ten years on this script, and the main character is called Dom Cobb. <laughs> 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 what a name! <laughs> Which. Which I think is the best name in some I've history, got but... like I've got some little um trivia for later about some of the names in this movie. Um, but I'll save that for later. Mm. Um, but yeah, so to mm, explain yeah. how extraction works in this movie, it's pretty out there. It's pretty not possible unless the government's doing some stuff that we don't know about yet. Whoa. Um, in a dream state your conscious defences are lowered and it makes your thoughts vulnerable to theft, which is called extraction. And they go to you go to sleep with some other people and they go into your dream with you and they try to get you to say things and do things until they get the information that they need, then they leave. So, Cobb and Arthur work to extract the information they need from Saito. Saito, yeah, Saito. But Cobb's wife, Mal, arrives and messes everything up. And that's Marion Cotillard. Cotillard. I'm very bad at pronouncing foreign French things. <laughs> French names. <Yeah. laughs> and Cobb, for some reason, and like she's like, oh, you know, what are you boys doing here? And he's like, hey, you get out of here. Um, and they go about like, you know, their little espionage heist. Um, and Cobb, for some reason, trusts his wife's projection because she's not actually a real person, as we come to find out throughout the mm. movie, to act as an anchor while he repels out of a window for some reason. <laughs> he's like, sit here, lady. And she, he's just like, cool, Don't I'll just move. jump out of this window <laughs> while an imaginary person sits in a chair. <laughs> Fucking sit. It was a, a, <laughs> Why didn't this work? <laughs> it was a very James Bond move in a way. Mm. Um, very. Because mm. she's the femme fatale in the movie. And uh, he's like, be my anchor while I just yeet myself out of this window. Um, <laughs> and then she gets up and leaves him. And yeah, so then they go in. Well, he's 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 in a tuxedo as well. Mm. James Bond. And he has a silenced pistol. Yeah. Pew, pew. Gold. Yeah. Nolan's just got, got the hots of Bond in this Finger. movie. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to be writing the next James Bond movie. Um... Song. Oh, I can't wait not to listen. No, oh, how dare you. <laughs> well, you? I will make you listen Ouch. through my constant singing. But yeah, so... <laughs> they, you know, Mal, like, ruins everything for everybody. Um, basically, they get halfway through the bloody heist. He breaks into a safe and gets the information out. And then Mal shows up with Arthur... He's now a hostage. Sato is also there and he's like, Hey, what the fuck do you think you're doing in my brain, boy? And then... <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so their plan's falling apart now. And um, Mal shoots Arthur. Like, she threatens and she shoots him. And because she's saying... he's, You know, they're like, Oh, well, if you get killed in a dream, you wake up. And... Mal's like, well, no, if I just hurt him, like, pain is in the mind, he'll just feel yeah. the pain, but he won't actually die. So she shoots him, 
Um, and then in a last ditch effort, Cobb shoots Arthur in the face and he wakes up in a Grammy apartment instructing another man who was also there named Nash to give Cobb a kick to wake up. And I thought it was pretty funny because he give, he's like, oh, yeah, give him the kick. And he's like, what? And he's like, wake him up. And it's like, if he's there, surely, surely you, you would, would know. know like how <laughs> this is all going to work. So Cobb's like tied to, yeah. he's sitting on a chair above a bathtub. So then they push him into a bathtub full of water and he wakes up. Um, they then they then wake up Sato, and they are now in this apartment, and an angry mob is on their way to absolutely rip the place to shreds. Um, they begin to interrogate him to get information that they were originally trying to get out of him from the previous dream, because surprise, we're in a dream right now. Um, when it's also revealed that they are all these boys are sitting on a shinkansen in Japan, and they're asleep. So they were in a dream, mm. then they're in another dream, and then there's reality where they're actually asleep. Um, a teenage boy, who is apparently important enough to be performing all of this, you know, medical stuff on them, but not important enough to get a name or appear ever again, um, <laughs> puts a <laughs> pair of headphones on Nash and begins to play an Edith Piaf song called Non Je Ne Regrette Rien which features strongly throughout the movie. And Arthur, he can kind of hear it too because he's actually sitting next to Nash on the train. And so they kind of realise um, that this is a signal that it's nearly time to wake up from the dream and they start to get a bit antsy. So the interrogation intensifies and they throw Sato face down onto the floor. But then he realises that the rug is made out of polyester, not wool, and that he is in fact a dream, mm. in a dream as well. So... Their plan is super fucked up now. Um, and this is where everything mm. starts to get really confusing because it's just dreams everywhere. Sorry, is, is, is this where they start to get confusing? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, it is not his dream though and it turns out it is in fact Nash's dream. Um, and he is what is known as an architect who builds the dream for events to take place. So and a, and the mob that's coming mm. is actually his subconscious who's realized that he's in a dream and his subconscious is coming to take out the people that are in his dream. Yeah, defend yeah. him. Kind yeah, of. yeah. So the mob swarms the group and they wake up on the Shinkansen and get off at the next station, leaving Sato behind. And he wakes up and he's like, "What the fuck just happened? What? <laughs> that was a dream? Okay, I'm just gonna sit calmly on this train." Um, <laughs> 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 I'm gonna go back yeah. to sleep. <laughs> Good night, everybody. So they get they all get off the train and, at different places, and they start to get all their belongings together to flee the country. As the person or the people who paid them to get the information out of Sato will be out to kill them, but they are in fact incep intercepted and picked up by none other than Sato, who is tipped off by the architect Nash, who just like the Japanese boy on the train is. Very forgettable. Um, <laughs> mm. It gets carried away by two of Sato's guys, yeah. it mm. looks like. Yeah. So, so. And Sucks to be him. <laughs> Sato reveals he arranged their mission to test Cobb for a seemingly impossible job, implanting an idea in a person's subconscious, so not extraction, but in fact inception, which is the name of the movie. Oh! Insert the movie title Inception. here. Inception. <laughs> wow. It's a good thing. It's a good thing that Batman was called Batman because he says he's Batman a lot. I'm Batman. <laughs> but yeah. So, thoughts so far, boys. I've been talking a lot. <laughs> it's great. It's a good. It's a damn good opening. It, yeah. A lot. A yeah. lot happens, and it establishes. The make-believe world very thoroughly. Yeah, it wastes no no time um, in uh, in throwing you right into the to the silliness of it all as well. Yeah, um, <laughs> and like it, it doesn't piss about for forty minutes explaining dreams within dreams. It's like, all right, this is what's happening, and if you're not with me, you're going to be left behind, audience. Yeah, yeah. Um, it doesn't hold hands, which is you know to its credit. Yeah, yeah. But it does heaps of good things for that because it kind of it tells you that there can be dreams within dreams, 
but then you also get the way they can work is they can all be in someone else's yeah. dream. And then obviously the architect plays a big role in that because he builds the whole dream. Yeah. But then you also get the information about the kick yeah. and you get death and pain yeah. in the world as well. Like it all just kind of comes together really yeah. well. And we are introduced to the little elusive spinny top as well, which play, ends up playing a really big yes. part in the movie um, eventually. <laughs> yeah, Cobb's totem. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so... Sato wants Cobb to convince Robert, the son of Sato's competitor, through Inception, um, to dissolve his father, Maurice Fisher's company. Um, so Sato kills Nash and promises to clear Cobb's criminal status, which, honestly, I'm going to get into this later, but his criminal status actually doesn't make any fucking sense when we find out why he's a criminal, <laughs> but that's fine. Mm. But yeah, so he just wants to mm. come home to his children... Um, and be back in America and be their daddy, which is you know pretty average um, motivation, motivation. For, a, yeah. for a character. Um, but you know we'll move on. So Cobb mm. accepts, accepts the offer, and against Arthur, so Joseph Gordon-Levitt's judgment, Cobb travels to Paris to find a dream architect. Cobb's father-in-law, Stephen Miles, which is um. Fuck, Michael Caine, sorry. Yeah, Michael sorry, Caine. I had like a... I'm Michael uh, Caine. I think I had an aneurysm for a second there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's kind of like Hugo <laughs> Weaving. You know how Hugo Weaving always just plays Hugo Weaving no matter what he is in? Michael Caine just plays Michael Caine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is... And I forgot how little he is yeah. in this too. He's in like three scenes. Yeah. And like, he, yeah. yeah, yeah, and barely does anything. And he's like a powerhouse actor too. Like, And he's just like, yeah, I'll just show up for mm. a bit. Hello, I'm Michael Caine. Leonardo DiCaprio, he's, he's, you've got to be a father. <laughs> he is drastically underused <laughs> yeah. in this movie, but I suppose after being in yeah. uh, in three great big blockbusters by the same guy right beforehand, you'd be like, yeah, I'm yeah. fine. You know, use me for what you want. Pay me my $20 million. I'll sit behind a desk and we'll, <laughs> we'll go from there. So... And we'll talk. Going back you know, to the Michael Caine whole. playing Michael Caine thing and the Hugo Weaving playing Hugo Weaving thing, I once met a guy in New Zealand and he was driving me to Rivendell, like to the place where Rivendell was to see Rivendell, and he goes, oh, you never noticed that like Hugo Weaving never changes his voice for anything? And then he played me a clip and it was, welcome to Rivendell, Mr. Anderson. <laughs> 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 it fucking it stuck with that was like five years ago and I've never forgotten I've never That's forgotten so weird. <laughs> welcome to Rivendell Mr. Anderson <laughs> okay so yeah so Cobb's father-in-law introduces him to Ariadne weirdest name I've ever heard but we'll go with it <laughs> yep yeah. not, a, not a real name um, so she's a gr- well yeah so it's played by Elliot Page um, I think that one thing we're going to note Elliot Page recently came out as trans if we refer to Elliot Page as she, we're referring to Ariadne, the female character. Um, otherwise, we'll try our best to say they, them for the rest of it. Um, yeah, but yeah, we're referring yeah. to the character. Um, so, a graduate student skilled in creating labyrinths, um, which I might add, I'm just going to carry on. So, Cobb's father in law. <laughs> I was going to say, is that a major? Yeah, I major, in, I major labyrinths? in labyrinths. <laughs> so, yes, but he's, it's funny though because he doesn't take a lot of convincing. He's like, no, you're not going to corrupt another one of my students. And he's like, come on. And then he's like, you know what? Go for it. Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you my best student. Yeah. What are you going to say? So, Cobb takes, takes Ariadne out and she draws him a maze. But if you pause the movie quickly, it is impossible to solve the maze. I pause the movie and there's no way into the middle of the maze it's all blocked off so it's like oh yeah that is impo- yeah i can't solve it in a minute because i can never fucking solve it <laughs> <laughs> yeah that is a hard maze yeah you're not wrong yeah there's no way actually <laughs> yeah she just draws like a she just draws a yeah. circle so there's no way in <laughs> do this <Yeah>. maze <laughs> so yeah so Cobb introduces ariadne to the basic rules in terms of dream sharing technology such as a totem, which is an object that lets the person know they're not dreaming. Which I'm just wondering. A totem in a dream, wouldn't you just like have it in your pocket 
when you're awake and then when you're in a dream because you can pick obviously they seem to be able to pick and choose what they bring into the dream why wouldn't they just not bring a totem into the dream so then they go oh i put my hands in my pockets oh i don't have a totem i guess i'm in a dream <laughs> like why would they be like here's my totem don't touch it oh you touched it now you've ruined it like it does they don't yeah they, they don't make sense <laughs> The yeah. totem thing. I was like, yeah. yeah, I've never thought of the, that. The totem thing, yeah, it's just very odd. They're like, this is mine. Yeah. But <laughs> it's never really explained as to why no one else can touch it. I don't, I never got that or follow what they were doing with it. No, no. So the, the idea was if someone else touches it, then they can recreate that if you guys are dream sharing. Mm. Uh, like if they're the architect they can recreate your totem so then you yeah. go oh I'm awake and they would know the physics of it so because Cobb's, Cobb's totem never stops spinning in a dream they would be like okay well easy I'm gonna but you could have probably guessed that I suppose <laughs> but yeah make it so Cobb's never stops spinning yeah so oh it makes it fall over so he's like oh I'm in reality instead of a dream yeah fair anyway Kieran <laughs> Carry on. I'm already confused. But yeah, like, like I said, they, they, totems are introduced, but I think it's literally just introduced for the big ending, which we'll get to. But like like I said, you could just be like, I've got a totem when I'm mm. awake, but when I'm in a dream, I don't have one, so I know I'm in a dream. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but yeah, so, and he also tells her like what a kick is, which is a physical jolt that brings a dreamer out of a dream. So they kind of liken it to when um, you are falling asleep and then your brain does that weird thing where it thinks you're falling and then you go and then you wake up so they kind of recreate Mm. that which Mm. also the physics of that doesn't make a lot of sense either but i digress we'll continue so (laughs) um and also so Cobbs is a spinning top and he says to ariadne you need to make your own top like or your own totem but i'm wondering what is so unique about a spinning top because you know that everybody knows how a top works like every like you know that if you spin a top it's going to do that and then it's going to fall over eventually but and they're meant to be unique but like what's so unique about his top like what what about his top in particular uh, is so different yeah. to a regular top that nobody would understand oh <laughs> i thought the same yeah especially the chest piece whatever way you flick it it's going to fall yeah. that way like well, this yeah. If I flick it forward, it's gonna yeah. fall forward. It doesn't. It doesn't make. Like, this was. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go on. I was just said it doesn't make sense. <laughs> I was gonna say like the the biggest problem that like I think because I, I watched this with my partner, we were saying that throughout it, nothing's ever really surreal enough. Mm-hmm. Like we do. Obviously, we do have a, a, a going down the line. There's the spinning corridor fight and the the Paris mm-hmm. streets exploding and whatnot. But everything in these dreams is pretty normal. Like, yeah. I have... There's no um, 12-foot-tall Amazonian women, mm-hmm. you know, coming to abduct me from high school. Yeah. Well, and, to, well, you know, the stuff is like my <laughs> dreams. There's no... No one has d- sex dreams about their friends in these well, dreams. Well, I'm like, just going to... If you delved into my... There's no I'm dinosaurs. Gonna be, yeah. I'm going to be devil's advocate dreams. here because the whole point of this is they don't want the people to know that they're dreaming because they want them to think it's real life and that they're going to you know divulge information to them so that's probably why it doesn't have any of the weird shit in it because by design they want it to be as realistic as possible but i will i do have stuff to say about that anyway (laughs) but we'll get there yeah well yeah no no shameful sex dreams which is what i think was really missing (laughs) from this movie no going to school and realizing you're not wearing pants yeah (laughs) um but yeah so, here we go. Although Cobb's first rule is to never use memories to build dreams, the memory of his dead ex-wife, Mal, violently invades his shared dream with Ariadne, who shows up. So, like, they do the whole... Pa- this is the whole Paris scene. They're in Paris and she everything explodes and they yeah. go back into the dream. And Ariadne is doing too many crazy things. Here we go, Dane. This is in my notes. So, they're doing too many crazy things, Right? So that she's mm. folding the world in on itself. She's creating new things, blah blah blah. And then the oh, the yeah. subconscious re- realizes that they're dreaming and that there's somebody else in the dream, and then starts to attack her. And then that's when Mole shows up and stabs her in the stomach. 
Yeah. And then that's that's answered my questions. Yeah. Then Ariadne is kind of like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> I just got who stabbed. Who the fuck was that? <laughs> yeah. Why did I get stabbed in your dream, bro? Like that's actually kind of fucked. <laughs> and then Cobbs is like, I don't want to talk about it. Leave me alone. And then that that's the end of that for now. Um, Cobb then travels to Mombasa to recruit Ames. A British forger, played by none other than the very handsome, a very electric Tom Hardy. Oh my goodness! Um, I love Tom he, Hardy. He I'm just is the to man. Say it right now. Yep. Even in Lock. We all love Tom Hardy. Even in Lock, which was a fucking terrible movie, <laughs> I was still like, you know what? Even he's so dynamic. Even if he's in two um, Venom movies, I still love him. He's yeah. He's still <laughs> he just good. can do so much, like. Even with just one shot on him, like the smallest shot, like Dunkirk, he had like yeah, the half pilot of his mask face on. was covered. Yeah. Yeah. And then as Bane, half of his fucking face was covered, but he could still like, he still fucking brought it yeah. every time. Oh, Tom mm. Hardy's He's a so good. Man. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and Yusuf as well. He's a Kenyan chemist and he's going to aid with the mission as well because he has like a special concoction m- all mixed up for Cobb and his boys to go sleepy buys. So that's good. It's just roofies. That's his secret. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Extra strong roofies. Well, that's why they don't call them floories, right? <laughs> <laughs> why do they call them roofies? You you never end up on the roof. Yeah, weird. You always end up on the floor. <laughs> um but yeah, so, Cobb, so then they all come back to Paris and they convene with Sato to discuss the plan. And Sato reveals, like, so they're all like, oh, yeah, he's going to go on the longest flight ever, which is Sydney to Los Angeles. How are we going to do it? He's going to be on a plane. Like, oh, my God, this, there's so many working parts. And Sato, he's a fucking cool boy. He just buys the fucking airline. And he's like, yo, what's up? I bought the airline. Let's fucking do it. <laughs> so... They're ready. They got all the stuff. Ames maintains that the incepted idea must be simple and seemingly self-generated. Like, you can't walk into a dream and, like, hold um, Cillian Murphy by the sides of his face and go, give up your father's company. <laughs> you can't do apparently that. Apparently that doesn't work, yeah. <laughs> yeah, apparently, in the, in the even though the realm of possibilities in this movie is endless, you can't do that. <laughs> so they they have to figure out like a way to make it feel organic. Yeah, to yeah like he thought of it dreamer. himself. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they decide that they're not gonna just do one dream. They're not gonna do two fucking dreams. They're doing three motherfucking dreams. Oh so a dream within a dream within within a dream. <laughs> yep. Yeah. A triple up. It's a lot of snoozing going on. Yeah. <laughs> And I think we also, like, I haven't really explained this, but every dream layer time, like, is longer, I guess. Yeah. So that's something that ha- is a big part of the movie that they have to, every time they go into a further layer of the dream, they have to also make up for a time difference. So, yeah, we'll, it, it it doesn't make a lot of sense, but like that's just yeah. that's just part of the reality. Yeah. Yeah. What is it? It's like it's like a minute or so is sixty minutes in the next layer, and then it like yeah, it like yeah, and then quad, it doubles. Yeah, like, like it goes quad, quad, yeah. triples or doubles or some shit, and it just yeah, it keeps getting yeah, more and more. Something mm. ridiculous. Yeah. It just makes up its own rules as it yeah. goes along. I think it's because it's going off of that thing where like you know you'll have a dream. And you'll wake up and realize, oh, I was only asleep for a couple of hours when it felt like you had a really long dream. Mm. I guess is yeah. where the, so the logic is kind of going off of the logic of like when you're asleep, when, what people universally experience. Yeah. Um, but the rules. I suppose is. I suppose yeah. Well, with the rules, it's like it's rules that Nolan has made up, so no one's going to be able to be like, oh, he didn't do his research. Yeah. That's not how it <laughs> yeah, is. Yeah, exactly. It's not how dreams work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they make all these plans. They like send, um, Tom Hardy's character out to kind of profile Robert's, um, godfather, who's a big part of the company and kind of learn about him and his mannerisms because he's going to copy him in the dream. Um, and they got to figure out a way to make him think of the idea of getting up his 
father's company by himself so they really look into the relationship between robert and his father during their planning Mm. um ariadne becomes worried so Cobb's having a little snooze he's in a little dream and he because he's gone under so many times he can't dream when he's sleeping normally he can only dream when he's actually under all of those drugs that make you go into inception land um so she catches him asleep so she kind of goes hey you know what it would be a huge violation of his privacy if i just jumped into the dream with him you know i don't see any problem with that he's having a weird so, sex dream in there yeah that really annoyed yeah, yeah. really annoyed me that part. that was so strange it's just like wow wouldn't you be like you know what you're not on my team because you just like violated my trust so hard i was asleep and you fucking barged yeah. in there and he's their boss kind of I yeah <laughs> Like, yeah. She's been on yeah. the team for like two days. Very intrusive. Yeah. He owns 51% yeah, of this company. <laughs> yeah, and she's like, because she's just started and she thinks she's like, oh, her character, oh, sorry, Elliot's character in it, annoyed the shit out of me throughout this entire movie. Yeah. Just because of those reasons yeah. alone. Yeah. But yeah, so she jumps into his bloody dream without his permission and then has a bit of a sticky beak. That he has a bit of a sticky deep poke around. He's actually built like this kind of dream world for himself. I think it's kind of like you know, like when you go to sleep and you are having a good dream, and then you wake up and you're like, "I'm just gonna go back asleep. I'm going to keep going with that dream for a little bit." <laughs> like <laughs> everybody's done it. I think that's kind of what the yeah. logic is here. That like that the person who's the architect, or whenever you make a dream world for yourself, you can always revisit yeah. it because you made it. Yeah, you it. can go back to it, and it's your own little special place yeah um but yeah so he's got he's made like a big shrine basically in his subconscious to his dead wife which we we, we realize she's dead um and um basically reliving memories that he has with her Mm. in his dreams because he's harboring a lot of feelings of guilt about her death and that's why her projection keeps barging into his dreams and making a fucking mess of everything yeah um so when robert fisher died oh wait sorry so ariadne warns cobb that he cannot keep mal in his subconscious forever and that he needs to tell everybody what the fuck is going on with him um because it could cause serious danger for everybody else because he has no control over it like it just keeps making trouble um, um, is this so yeah. is this the scene where she's in the elevator? Is this this one? And she goes to the yeah. hotel room. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't I wasn't sure when to bring this up, but Marion Coltard, or however you pronounce her name, is Coltiard. Coltiard is I think terrifying in this movie. In this scene, yes, she's she scary. literally like scares the absolute crap out of me. The way she comes up to that elevator and like this is after you've seen her stab Elliot mm. like Elliot Page's character. Yeah. And then this scene and there's so <laughs> many scenes. She's so intense and just absolutely goddamn terrifying. Yeah. And like um I don't know if you guys know this. Um I'll just do a very quick um fact, but uh Nolan originally envisioned this as a horror film about dream stealers. Yeah. And, like, yeah. that, I get major mm. horror vibes every time she's on screen. I'm so scared of her in this movie. Oh, she does, she does like, the yeah. Hannibal Lecter, Anthony Hopkins, no blinky thing. Yeah. Like, and, and it's just so intense. And Oh, it's just... Oh, she is so good. She is so good in she's this movie. She's so bloody good. And I love it, too, because, like, you see, like, she is haunting Cobb's world. And, like, you see it, mm. like... It's yeah, it's so good. She's and, incredible, and in she this just movie. Like, she's the classic like femme fatale as well. Like she just shows up whenever she fucking wants. Yeah. And she's sexy and she causes trouble. And she keeps saying like that we're waiting for a train mm. like thing over and over again, which gets really fucking creepy by the end. Yeah. What were you gonna say, Dane? I was gonna say with the whole horror vibes, because um, where I read the same thing, Ryan, that it was gonna be like a little horror movie. All I could picture is her. Did either of you ever play the Fear games? Yeah. Yeah, like yeah. a little old, like a little Alma that just pops yeah. up, scaring the absolute living piss yeah, out of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they were good games. I wish it was a horror. I think I would prefer this movie if it was a horror. It would be really cool. Yeah. It would be way cooler. Mm. 
But he just can't. He can't help himself with his little action, science fiction, espionage movies. He can't help himself. He just wants to mash all of the genres together and make his own Nolan genre. <laughs> he sure does the Nolan verse. Yeah. So. Robert Fisher's father, Maurice, dies and the team decides to execute their plan on the Trans-Pacific flight from Sydney to Los Angeles where they bought the airline so it's all good and then Robert's going to be a passenger on it in first class, mind you. Very Ooh. fancy. Um, Free champagne, please. So on the plane, <laughs> on the plane, Cobb discreetly spikes Robert's drink with a sedative, which I'm kind of like, why didn't you just get... Because you've got an air hostess and the air hostess <laughs> was in on the whole thing. Yeah. Like, Why didn't she just spike it? She was literally... Yeah, like she literally has the shit. Like she has the stuff in the in the compartment that she goes and gets out. So she knows that something's going on and that he's going to be asleep. Like they've obviously told her, "Hey, we're going to put this guy to sleep. We need to get this thing and then give it to us because we're going to do this with it." Why didn't she just give him a spiked drink? Like why did we have to have the whole ooh Leonardo DiCaprio slits the Nicky with his roofies? Ooh, la, la. Oh. <laughs> At least it's not as bad ooh, as the Prometheus spiking scene. Do you guys remember that? Oh. With Michael Fassbender. I actually went... And he literally like sticks day, his finger in the guy's drink. And the guy looks at yeah. him and he does it. And then hands him the drink and he's like, cool, thanks. And just drinks it. <laughs> I actually... Oh. Funny story. I put... I was like, you know what? I feel like watching something like kind of spooky, but kind of action-y. Put Prometheus on and I watched probably... I have So I've watched it probably twice. And I put it on for about... I watched about five minutes and then I just was like, you know what? It's a no I'm for me, good. and I switched it right the <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> it, it ruined the entire universe of Alien. Oh. Uh, like, Ryan, I know that you've said it's the most beautiful movie you've ever yeah. hated. I just fucking flat I, out hated yeah, it. Look, it made me so very angry. I'm going to make an executive decision right now. We're never fucking watching that movie. It literally just gives me a headache. I was, I I was about to say, it. we should do it on the show, but maybe we won't. Because... There's, there's a lot of anger from all three I, I, of us. I'd like to. For I it. literally don't think I can sit through that movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, talking I, about pretentious. I only watch it the once. That I movie mean. is pretentious. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's like, hey, you remember all of those good things you love about <laughs> Alien? Well, forget all about them. Because here this is. <laughs> I don't know. I, 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 I think... I, I think we really should. I think maybe Ryan and I have mm. outvoted you. Oh, Executive man. decision. I'm not watching it. This is going to be like year 11 English where I don't read the book. I'm not doing <laughs> Just give me a synopsis online. I'm going to the... I'm gonna get the Cliff's Notes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to sign up to all these dodgy websites to get book reports. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so he spikes his drink with his roofies and the team enters into a shared dream with Robert and in this one, Yusuf is the architect, which I'm also like, okay, so how did, how does the architect, so they, they've got Ariadne as the architect, right? Mm. So does she make all the dreams up and then she goes, here's what the dream's going to look like. And they have to sit there and be like, okay, I'm going to remember all of this stuff because there's a different dreamer and architect for each level. Like, if that makes sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It, it, no, it does make also. sense. I had no idea. I thought Ariadne was the architect. She was the architect, so she made oh, the layout. Okay, but, but then it's not the people. So everybody, the person who stays awake each time is the dreamer of that dream. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you yeah, know yeah. how. So Yusuf is the driver mm. of the van while everybody's in the van because he's actually the dreamer and he's the one who's dreaming up Los Angeles, like yeah, yeah. that they're driving through. Yeah, like, yep. Yeah. Yeah, I get so, it. So, uh, yeah. like, but then I'm so so by design. Does that mean that Ariadne made up and was like, "Here you go, Yusuf. This is what you have to dream." Mm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. It doesn't. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. But yeah, so at each dream level, the person generating the dream stays behind to set up a kick to awaken other team members from the deeper dream. And these kicks must occur simultaneously despite time flowing faster in each successive level. Um, and that they use the song from the beginning to do that. That's the same song that they use every time. So the first level is Yusuf's dream of Los Angeles. Um, they... In the pouring rain? Ma- yeah, in the pouring rain. So they managed to take Robert hostage, 
but they're immediately ambushed by a team of rifle-wielding assailants, revealing that Robert's been trained to protect himself subconsciously, because obviously this is a very big problem over the, in this universe. <laughs> People going in your dreams and stealing stuff. Um, so Sato gets shot in this dream by one of the boys, because they're just there's bullets flying everywhere. And Cobb realises too late that experts have helped Robert militarise his subconscious against unwanted extraction. Mm-hmm. And during... A car, tra- a car chase trying to hide from the gun-toting men. A train from Cobb's subconscious plows through the middle of the street for some fucking reason. Um, and just causes even more mayhem. And you'd think by that point that the bloke who was... Yeah. They're trying to get the information out of would go, Hey, this isn't normal. There's no train tracks around <laughs> here. Am I in a dream? Where did this train come like- from? How weird. <laughs> and then... Yeah... So, to make matters worse, Yusuf's powerful sedative may leave whomever is killed in the dream in limbo, which is unconstructed dream space. And even though they're a bit like, oh, shit, this is really bad, they're kind of like, well, we're going to be either stuck in here and all get killed and put into limbo, or we could go into the next dream space and keep going. So, they all decide to go on with the plan. Um, So... Concerned for the team's safety, Ariadne asks Cobb um, what the heck is going on with him and his dead wife. And Cobb reveals that he and Mole had been in limbo before. And they were sedated for five hours of real time, but they spent 50 years in a dream world. Um, And things started to get a little hazy and they weren't really sure what was real and what was fake anymore because they spent so long there. And when Mole refused to return to reality... Cobb used a form of inception by reactivating her totem, which is the little spinny top. So Cobb's little spinny top was actually originally his wife, wife's, which, like I said, spinning tops are not that special. Everybody knows how fucking spinny top works. That chick was doomed from the start. <laughs> so <laughs> after waking up from the dream space, so they ended up like becoming old people in the dream space. And then they put their heads on the train tracks and committed suicide to wake up. Um, And she still believed when she woke up in reality that she was dreaming. Um, When she she was, she kept trying to convince Cobb like to wake, to get themselves back into the dream by committing suicide. Um, She ends up framing Cobb for her murder. And this is where I brought up before. His criminal status doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it. So she sets up the hotel room Mm. um, to make it look like they had a big fight and that he pushed her out the window. And when he... So what what she does is she waits at a hotel across the road on the same floor with a window that looks directly in to the other window. And then Cobb shows up and everything's a mess. And he's like, where the fuck is my wife? And she's like, hey, baby, I'm out across the road. Come and get me. And um, so they're, like, yelling and carrying on across the street, which I'm wondering, they're yelling and carrying on. How have people not looked up and gone, oh, there's a chick standing on that ledge over there Mm. and the guy is all the way over there and she's going to jump off the building and he's nowhere near her. Um, And then he doesn't convince her to step back in and she throws herself off the building and she dies. Um, but then he has to flee the country because she did all of this stuff. Like she called a psychologist and said she was afraid of him and everything like that. And, you know, messed up the hotel room and stuff. Um, so he flees the country and he leaves his children with his father-in-law, which is Michael Caine. But to be honest, if he just hung around and waited for forensics, they would have proved that she jumped out another (laughs) window. Like... Mm. And you think that there would be security cameras and all sorts of things outside of the building yeah, and yeah. in. And then people... I would assume. There people were people who heard it. Yeah. Like, yeah, people who mm. probably would have seen it because, like, if it was set in, you know, LA or New York or somewhere where it looked like it was set, surely somebody would have fucking been at the bottom when she fell and they could have gone, oh, she's facing this way. Like, she fell mm. face down. Yeah. She might have done a sick. She might have done a sick twist or something on the way down. <laughs> Do a flip. <laughs> Do a big flip. <laughs> yeah. Also, just be like, just go next door and dust for her prints because she's rented <laughs> two rooms. <laughs> two rooms. Yep, next to each other. 
Yeah. yeah. I know people have a lot yeah. to say about the American justice system, but surely they could have figured that one out. <laughs> oh, God. Like, come on. Yeah. Yeah, very it's um, very strange. Yeah. And I'm like, he's like, Oh shit, mm. I'm a I'm a criminal now. I better run. <laughs> <laughs> Without waiting to see if anybody was like, hey, you're a criminal. But then, obviously, they must have thought he was a criminal because he wasn't allowed back in the country. Or was he just assuming? Mm. You know what they say about assuming, right, boys? It makes an ass out of you and me. (laughs) 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 I did, all right. (laughs) (laughs) You can have it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks, thanks. Yeah, I don't know. It's, It's... it's a bit weird. I, d- I don't know. The, the whole scene is... It doesn't like, make sense. No. It's a really well-made scene, but it just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. I'm like, obviously like she... Like, it was a really tense... It was... Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, obviously she was desperate to for Cobb and her to escape this dream world that she believed she was in. But then... Yeah, I don't know. I don't get it. I'd like, yeah. Framing your husband, mm-hmm. leaving your kids. She really wanted... Yeah. Yeah. She wanted him to like she she made it so that he had no she wanted yeah. she thought that she had made it that he would have no choice but to join her and jump off the building with her but he knew that he was in reality. Yeah. And knew hey, you know, you're not going to wake up, you're going to be fucking splatty kapooey <laughs> on the floor dead boy. Mm. So it just didn't work out how she thought that she would. Yeah. How yeah. But, yeah, I guess in the Nolan verse, anything goes, you know? Mm. Um, but, yeah, so... Um, Couldn't Michael Caine Tom move his Hardy. kids out of the country? <laughs> yeah. If Leo Maybe can't return home, there. why doesn't he, like, Michael Caine just take him to Europe? That's where Leo's yeah, been hanging out. Yeah, because Michael Caine was in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and credits. Yeah, because, like... <laughs> That's what he's like. What are you doing here? And he's like, Oh, you know, Paris has some of the most difficult extradition laws to that possibly exist. And it's like, Okay, why don't you just live there with your children mm. then? If you're never going to get extradited. Can I just say, with that line, mm. with that line there, um, that's actually a line that's uttered in Catch Me If You Can. Ah, it's a cheeky little cheeky. nod. Cheeky little nod to the uh, other character. I oh, love that's that. Fun. That's just very cool. I love that I movie. I was going to say, that movie is so mm, much fun. Movie. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Spielberg. It's been a long time since I've seen it. Spielberg. I about, yeah, I was about to say yeah. it's Spielberg. It is. I, I don't want to I don't want um, to burst the bubble too much. But have you guys heard about how much of that guy's story's been refuted now? Really? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's okay. That doesn't doesn't ruin the okay. movie for me. Oh, well, it's still a fun good. movie. Yeah, if you look into it, yeah. yeah. Apparently, yeah. Not much of it's actually that true. He's just a <laughs> real good storyteller. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you see where he ended up. He's obviously very good at fucking lying. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs>